Ray, I did my doctorate in hardcore neuroscience, neurophysiology, and in trying to understand what the brain is, most of the people I talked to or my old professors in neuroanatomy and neurochemistry, what I'd really like you to do is, is reflect on what a brain is, how it functions, uh, coming at it from a different perspective as a computer scientist and as a thinker who's, who, who's thought about brains in a different way. Well, it's a little bit like asking the different blind observers what an elephant is, and depending on what part you're examining, they may describe it differently. And we're still at a stage where all of these different perspectives, modeling one neuron, modeling portions of a neuron, like, like the tubules or the filaments, uh, or modeling entire regions, uh, are, are valid and are giving us greater insight. Uh, we are getting more and more information about the brain. Uh, the spatial resolution of brain scanning is doubling every year. We're not get, getting to the point where we can see in a living brain individual interneuronal connections and see them firing in real time. And we can see them creating new spines and new synapses. And we can actually see our brain create our thoughts for the first time. We also see our thoughts create our brain because that, <laughs> that is the, the feedback loop that gives us plasticity. And... But then the question is, okay, we're getting this data, and then the amount of data, by the way, is doubling every year. Can we make heads or tails of this? There's a vast amount of information. We are finding that we can actually understand how specific regions work. And as we get enough data about specific areas of the brain, we are succeeding in making models of how that region processes information. And fundamentally, that is what the brain does. Yes, it's partly analog and partly digital, it's massively parallel, whether our computers are, are more sequential, but fundamentally it's an information processor. And some processes or some efforts to, uh, to understand the human brain simulate at, at a very precise biochemical level. So for example, IBM has a project to simulate a significant slice of the cerebral cortex where we do our abstract reasoning, first at individual cell level, and then actually at the level of biochemical molecules. And that's one valid approach. We also find sort of the uh, neurological function level that we can take a whole region and ask the question, what does this region do to information? How does it represent it? How does it transform it to another region w without really modeling every single synapse and every single cell? And this has been done for a couple dozen regions of the human brain. A dozen regions of the auditory cortex have been modeled and simulated and then we can apply sophisticated tests to the simulation, and they get very similar results applying those same tests to human auditory perception. There's now a fairly recent model and simulation of several regions of the visual cortex. The cerebellum, which is where we do our uh, skill formation, has been simulated. We're actually beginning to understand how a nine-year-old child can actually catch a fly ball, because you know, they're not doing you know, 50 uh, simultaneous differential equations in real time. <laughs> They're actually able to directly translate the movement that they see in their eye to the movement of their hand, and it takes time to develop that skill, something called basis functions, which collapses all these differential functions, and that's how the cerebellum works. And we're finding that these different regions have the same structure repeated over and over again. The cerebellum is half the neurons in the brain. It's tens of billions of neurons, but it has one very simple structure that's repeated billions of times, it's able to learn a certain skill formation. We actually find when people learn cursive writing, there are groups of these structures within the cerebellum that learn each type of stroke and each type of movement for catching a fly ball or walking or talking, use the same structure over and over again. The cerebral cortex, where we do abstract reasoning, has the same structure repeated over and over again. That appears capable of doing a certain type of recursive function where we can take some complicated structure of symbols and represent it as one thing and then use that in another hierarchy. So we can do this hierarchical recursive thinking that's, part, that's reflected in our language, which is very unique. And that's something that human beings can do you know, more than other species, apparently. That's reflected in the cerebral cortex. <clears throat> we're still in an early stage of understanding the human brain, but we're showing that we can gather the data, we can turn that data into working simulations, we can test the simulations and find that they match human performance up to certain levels. And all of this is progressing exponentially. I've made the case that we will 
have simulations of all several hundred regions within 20 years. Some cognitive scientists would say that all this biology is interesting, but that's just a way of representing what's really the fundamental thing, which are these algorithms or ways of thinking from a cognitive point of view. It doesn't matter if it's in a brain or in a computer. It's all the same, and, and that's really what it's all about. Well, that's correct. I mean, when I studied computer science, we learned the intricacies of transistors and how they're constructed and the materials and all the differential equations that describe a transistor, and then you could learn what it does, and then you put multiple transistors together, and you can create something that multiplies numbers. But then you can just forget about all that, and we don't try to understand a computer in terms of exactly how the transistors are built. We understand them at the abstract level of what it's really doing to information. And through evolution, these different brain regions are processing information, and it is important to understand these different levels. I mean, it's important to understand physics, to understand chemistry, but Finally, when we learn chemical principles, we can throw the physics away. And biology is based on chemistry. You have to understand chemistry to some extent to understand what they're talking about, but then you can understand biological principles. And ultimately, you do get to what these brain regions are doing to information. There may be a whole complex region of the, there are, is a complex region of the brain that measures the time difference between certain sound signals coming from the two ears. It's a fairly simple algorithmic idea. There's a very complex structure that actually computes that. And the question comes up, well, this must be a vast complexity. We'll never be able to understand this. We can actually get a measure of how much complexity is in the brain, because the design of the brain is in the genome, the, the body also. And this, there's a lot of information there, but not that much. Even if, you, even if you assume, as I have always assumed, that the so-called junk DNA is not junk, because it controls gene expression, the genome is replete with redundancies. The sequence is repeated over and over again. One sequence called ALU is repeated 300,000 times. And for those of you who know about data compression, you know if there's a repetition of information, you can compress it without losing information. If you apply lossless compression to the genome, you get somewhere between 30 and 100 million bytes, which is not small, but it's a level of complexity that, that we can actually manage. And we are actually making very impressive progress. But it's important to know the progress is exponential. Because halfway through the Genome Project, the skeptics were saying, hey, you're seven and a half years into this 15-year project. You've done 1% of the project. This is going to take hundreds of years. But in fact, it doubled every year, and we finished the project on time. It's going to be the same thing with the brain, the precision, the scale, the amount of information, the, the, the number of regions, and the precision with which we're simulating. All of this is, is, is gearing up exponentially. And of course, the supercomputers that we can run these simulations on are doubling in power every year. And so, you know, 20 years from now, these technologies will be a million times more powerful than they are today. And we will finish the job, I believe, within 20 years. And that'll give us more insight into ourselves. We'll understand the brain better and understand how to fix certain problems better than we do today. And we'll, but it'll also, I think most importantly, give us an enhancement of the artificial intelligence toolkit we have. And I had an argument with Professor Poggio at MIT saying he's not learning much about uh, how to do machine vision from the human visual system. And I said, well, it's because you don't have good models yet. And recently I saw him and he said, you know, you are right. We now have these very good simulations of how human visual processing takes place in the human brain. We applied that to machine vision mm. and got a big quantum jump in performance. So we are going to learn how to create intelligent machines by learning how evolution solved this problem over billions of years. Why did then you use the word spiritual to talk about these machines that we'll, we will uh, create? Well, they're going to have similar capabilities that we associate with other systems or entities that we call spiritual, which are human beings. Because we're going to really reverse engineer the human brain and understand how it works, including those regions that deal with emotion, which is not some sideshow. That's actually the most complicated thing we do. And spiritual behavior and is, uh, is part of what the human brain does. And we will have entities that exhibit, for example, conscious behavior. And in my view, you can't fundamentally understand consciousness in objective terms, but these entities will appear just as conscious. They'll claim to be conscious. They'll be convincing. They'll be as convincing as human beings are. And so if we believe that human beings are, are spiritual, 
then these machines will be spiritual as well. They'll be as spiritual because they will be as capable of these very subtle emotions as human beings.